Now, I wonder if you underwent sexual transition and became a woman, would it then have been self-plagiarism or just plagiarism? That's an interesting question. I'm here to ask you the hard questions, Doctor. Yes, that is what you do. So it would, it would depend on your perspective if I was the same person or a different person. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. I just had a very intense conversation with Dr. Paul Merrick here in Phoenix, Arizona at FLCCC. We talked about corruption and scholarship, big pharma, industry, the peer review process. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Dr. Paul Merrick, it's a pleasure to talk to you. So I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but am I sitting with a self-plagiarist? I am a self-confessed <laughs> plagiarist. You're I've, self-confessed plagiarist? I'm a, yeah, I've conf publicly confessed to the fact that I am a plagiarist. Yeah, so uh, what did you plagiarize? Because I am myself. Also, I'm also a plagiarist. I plagiarized myself. It's a concept that I didn't plagiarize someone else. I plagiarized my own writing and apparently that's called plagiarism, which is really absurd because uh, <laughs> legally what you, your words are your words. You Correct. can't plagiarize your words. And Thomas Jefferson then would have plagiarized the Constitution because he used his own words. But apparently I was convicted by the medical journals of plagiarizing my own writings and my my paper was withdrawn based on the fact that I self-plagiarized. And so what it's kind of an interesting story because yeah. what I did is I, I was interested in, these are the old days, I was interested in obesity and the effect of obesity on different biological parameters. So I did a study, we collected patients and I reported the results of the study, got published. And then I decided, you know what, just to, to spread the word, I would write a review paper. So I wrote a review paper on the same topic, on the same topic, but it was a review paper, not a primary study. Now, obviously, it's the same topic, so right. they're going to be an overlap in the words. And your name hadn't changed. My name hadn't changed, but in fact, when they did a word count, my name and my affiliation counted in the duplicated words. So what they did is they got a software program <laughs> that looked at the the commonality of the words yeah. between what I wrote in the first paper and the second paper. And I think they were like 50% of the words were similar. But if you're writing on the same topic. And you're the same person. And I'm the same person. There's going to be an overlap. But it was a completely different paper. It had x-rays. It had. Uh, now I wonder if you underwent sexual transition and became a woman, would it then have been self-plagiarism or just plagiarism? That's an interesting question. I'm here to ask you the hard questions, Doctor. Yes, that is what you do. So it would, it would depend on your perspective if I was the same person or a different person, because being the same person, I was accused of self-plagiarism. Right. It's funny, nobody ever accuses anybody of stealing money from themselves. Yeah, obviously. I mean, it's like it's that's the exact same analogy. How yeah. can you how can you steal something from yourself? I mean, yeah. and so I was I was accused of stealing my own words. Okay, let, let, so look, for whatever reasons, people consider you a controversial figure because <laughs> I'm a self plagiarist. <clears throat> well, among other things, that's probably your least offense. Oh yes, your, your, your least. Uh, I, I want to talk about the controversy for a second, but I want to get. Render your opinion, what's your opinion about corruption in academic journals, specifically medical journals and medical institutions? Yeah. I know, I, full disclosure, I realize that is a massive topic, but what do you think is important to talk about that? And then we'll just dig down from there. Yeah, so I believe in science and I believe in the truth. And I think science is accumulating data and evidence and presenting that data. And it's, it's a progressive thing. It's not finite, it changes, it's dynamic. And it's based on conversation, it's based on dialogue. And science is really important in, in, in many, many disciplines. Today, is the, today uh, articulating that viewpoint makes you some kind of crazy conservative. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know, there, must, there are certain fundamental truths 
And, you know, those truths advance with time. I mean, we know that the earth rotates around the sun. Yeah, we know that drinking hemlock is not, not, a, not good a good art. thing. Yeah. There's certain you know, indisputable facts which are important. We know, we know about gravity. And so these are fundamental concepts that are really important in understanding the world we live in. And that's what really science is. It, it provides us with information that allows us objective, unbiased, to understand the world we live in. And, and, and did, 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 does the peer review process capture that? In your opinion, the, the, specifically the medical? Yes, yeah, so the whole, that, that's what I used to think. You know, peer review is not perfect and there are flaws with peer review, but I've discovered that the whole biomedical publishing system is fraudulent. It's completely based on fraud. It's completely controlled. The major medical journals dictate what is written. I mean, there are such things as ghost writers. So they determine the outcome of a study, and then they write about the outcome of a study, which can be completely made up by people who never participated in the study. What's the motivation for someone doing that? Oh, it's financial gain. They're trying to sell a product, and it's big pharma is behind this. So there's, there's, there's no question of doubt that if a paper even if it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, is financed by pharma or supported by pharma or looking at a pharmaceutical product, you can be guaranteed 100% in some way or other it's fraudulent. 100%. I think almost 100%. So, can you give can you give a specific example of that in case someone's thinking like, oh, like, I mean, I'll give you. We'll talk about remdesivir. Okay. I mean, you've probably heard of remdesivir. I've heard of it. I know I'm not a medical professional. Yeah, so remdesivir was used for the Ebola outbreak, and they actually had to stop using it. It was withdrawn because there was a 56% death rate with the use of remdesivir. But somehow it got resurrected with SARS-CoV-2. Fauci thought it would be a good idea to try remdesivir in um, covid so they did a so-called randomized study looking at remdesivir in COVID. There were multiple endpoints which included hospitalization and death. Halfway during the study, they discovered that they weren't going to meet the endpoint. So what they did is they changed the endpoint. They unblinded the study and changed the endpoint. Now, that in itself is scientific misconduct because it defeats the whole purpose of doing a randomized controlled Correct. trial where everyone is blinded. So they changed the endpoint and they used an endpoint which was really a meaningless endpoint, which was the length of hospital stay, mm. which yeah. they could manipulate. So the patients who, it was an unblinded study. So the patients who got remdesivir were discharged earlier. So of course they had a decreased length of stay. And so before the study had even ended, before the study had actually, they had enrolled the final patient, uh, Fauci in the White House had announced that the study was a wonderful success with wonderful results, and this was a miracle drug for COVID. We now know that's a complete lie, that the study was done by the WHO, which did not find that. So if it's really interesting, um, and most people haven't picked up on this, so there have been six studies on Rendezvous. Two of the studies showed a benefit. Both of those studies were sponsored by Gilead, who's the maker of remdesivir. There were four independent studies. And don't they have to, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure this is true, don't they have to disclose? They right? disclose it, but not all of the authors of those studies disclosed that they were being financed by Gilead. Okay, so let's, I want to linger on this because I think that this is incredibly important. Isn't that itself a breach of, forget about anything else, isn't just that one thing oh, a of breach? Of course, of okay. course, how could you be objective? Okay. <laughs> well, I know, I know, that's my, my, my master question. Okay, so we've, so an independent person with no dog in the fight would agree with us that that is a breach of ethics. Yes. So. Were those people held accountable or responsible? No. Okay, so this, now help me, please help me understand this. Why not? 
It's the way the system is rigged. So I'll tell you what happened. So there are two studies done by Gilead in which most of the people are employed by Gilead or paid by Gilead. And then if you actually look at the FDA um, committee which evaluated Remdesivir, about half of the members who sat on the committee, including the chairperson, were paid by Gilead. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were, it's, it's, I mean, anyone looking at this would say this is a joke. And then there were four independent studies which were not supported by Gilead, which showed that this, the drug was harmful. So how do you reconcile that you have two studies done by the pharmaceutical industry, which show a benefit of a drug, and you have the same drug being tested in four independent studies by people who have no skin in the game showing it's harmful. The only conclusion is they cheated. They, they, cheated, manip they, they manipulated they, they, the yeah, data yeah. to show a positive outcome where there wasn't one. Okay, so please help me understand this because for the life of me, I just cannot understand for example, are you familiar with the Claudine Gay plagiarism scandal? The president of Harvard was convicted. Oh, yes, yes. So she retained her job for 900000 Instead of, like, having her PhD revoked and thrown out in disgrace, she retained her, her not the president's position, but a faculty position for 900000 So why is the people on that study and other studies, why is it that these people commit fraud, violate clear codes of conduct, and in that case, I, I don't know... But, but I'm assuming that there's some kind of peer review integrity process, at least there, there is in the humanities. Why aren't those people subject to some kind of, I don't know, accountability, punishment? Like, help me understand, because I, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it either, because if you actually have a look, most of the studies published by Big Pharma are based on fraud. They manipulate the data or... What they do is when they submit the data to the FDA, they only submit the positive studies. Yeah, yeah. So the, the whole system is rigged. And if you think about it, what the pharmaceutical industry does is they design the study. Yeah. So their study design is such that they're going to manipulate the conduct of the study so that it's positive. They then collect the data, the pharmaceutical company, they analyze the data, and then they get ghost writers to report on the data. So the whole system, <laughs> they rig the whole system. I mean, if you were gonna do it honestly, what you would say, okay, we have drug X. Yeah. We're not gonna get yeah, the yeah, yeah. company that makes drug X to do the study because yeah, yeah. They, they have an enormous bias and conflict of interest. Let's get an independent company to do the study. Let them independently collect the data. Let them keep the study blinded until the study is done. Let them analyze the data before you break the blind. Then that's how you do an honest study. But this system has nothing to do with honesty, integrity, and science. It's driven by financial and other professional interests. And Careers are at stake and money's at stake. It's a completely bogus system. And so I used to read the journals I thought like JAMA, New England Journal, Lancet, I thought this was the ultimate truth, that it couldn't be possible that they lied, but they lie. And the, the main motivation for that, that lying, is financial. So it's financial gain, primarily, but it's also careers are at stake because, you know, if the more you publish or perish, the more right. you get published, the more prestigious you are, the more influence you have, and then influences your salary, your position, your ability to get grants. The whole system is a completely broken. I used to believe in the system because I think science is so important, but the, the whole process of science has been corrupted. And so you ha it's very difficult to know who to believe and what to believe. You know, I do these interviews and they're so depressing all the time. Oh, they are. So I can tell you, you know, one of my more recent interests is 
SSRI, so these yeah, are yeah. antidepressants. Yeah. So the whole, uh, and, and uh, it's a really unfortunate thing to say this, yeah. the whole of psychiatry is based on a big fraud yeah. because SSRIs have no antidepressant effect. They actually cause depression. Mm. SSRIs actually cause depression, they cause suicide, they cause homicide, they have profound side effects with no antidepressant effect. Maybe 2% of patients chronically who take an SSRI will have a positive therapeutic that, effect. Okay, so I mean, I've heard they have had no effect, but I didn't hear that they had negative. How could that possibly be given their widespread? Well, that's the fraud. It's the big pharmaceutical industrial medical complex have perpetrated one of the biggest frauds in medicine. And one of them is psychiatry. Psychiatry is based on fraud. It's like alchemy. Yeah, I mean, you may not know this, that, and it's a shocking thought that most of the mass shooters were on SSRIs and had delusional thoughts. I did not know that. That is such an important thing. I mean, you can go back to the Columbine shooter. Both the Columbine shooters were on SSRIs. You can look at the Aurora shooter. He was on an SSRI. You can look at almost all of the school shooters were on SSRIs. The FDA knows. The FDA has known since 19, I think, 72 that SSRIs cause suicidal and homicidal behavior. Homicidal behavior. In fact, it's a black box warning that if you take an SSRI, it will increase your risk of killing somebody. Boy, you know, if I was listening to this and I was some kind of intelligence agency in the third world, my first order of business would be to pump this into the drinking water of municipalities of my enemy countries. Okay. So, I mean, what I'm saying makes no sense. No, I mean, it, does, it, it, well, given the fact that it's still prescribed. It's one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in this country. Maybe 30% of people on SSRIs, and the tragedy is we put children on SSRIs. Did you SSRIs. say 30%? Yes, it's one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in this country. So we have the, the two biggest pharmaceutical hoaxes, or statins? Yeah, statins. Statins. Statins oh, actually. No, oh shit! I'm on a statin. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you, statins cause dementia. They cause. Oh jeez. That explains everything. And statins do not prevent heart disease. How can that be? But I get a. I have a high cholesterol. Yeah, I was going to say something really. Uh, I was going to be naughty. Use a bad word. You can Cholest do that. Cholesterol. Has no, there's no relationship between cholesterol and heart disease. It's a myth. It's a hoax. Okay, you're blowing my mind now because the, when I went to the, my doctor, we she had this like formula. It looked official to me. I mean, I'm not. Again, I have no medical knowledge. I'm not official. How the hell am I supposed to know? So she pl plugs in the, the chance of you know stroke or whatever with. Uh, I can't remember which statin I'm on and not, and it's like two percent difference. The lower, and I'm like, okay, that sounds reasonable. You know, you're addressing a really big problem, is that doctors have been misled, they have been brainwashed, and m mind games played with them by this conglomerate, and they, they are providing false information to patients. Patients believe what the doctors tell them, because why shouldn't they? The bottom line is, is that most of what doctors That's tell you... That's why you go to a doctor, because you're not a doctor and you don't know, right? But That's that, that premise is actually false, because most of what doctors tell you is based on fraud. And so doctors don't know this. Okay, okay. So it is a mind-boggling concept <laughs> that half... I don't know if the... Do you know what is the, the most commonly sold drug in the United States of America? A torvastatin, which is a statin. Statins do not reduce your risk of having a heart attack. And we know, I mean, there are, there's, there's actual data on this, like there's yes. evidence on this. Yes, so it may have a, have a temporary role in the, in, in the first few months after a heart attack. But we know, is it published data that shows in terms of primary prevention, statins have no benefit. We know that statins have minimal effect on cholesterol, total your LDL cholesterol. So this whole statin thing is a hoax.
Boy, you, you, you and me are like the life of the party when we go around talking to people. Where people are yes. going to leave their place super, <laughs> place super optimistic. Yeah, so people don't <laughs> like this kind of talk because I, I, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. You know, that yeah. I'm, but the problem is, you know, what people think is conspiracy theory becomes conspiracy fact. Yeah. So Okay, so let me ask you a question. So help me understand something. So hypotheticals. A friend of mine, just, just, just as an aside, said to me something. Um, Doug said... He thinks people who are less intelligent can't entertain hypotheticals. That was just a, a, a kind of a mind bomb to me. But here's my hypothetical to you. Every time I present someone with a hypothetical, I think of that. Let's say that we could wave a magic wand and Big Pharma disappeared tomorrow. Would there still be fraud in the system? Would there still be corruption in the medical system? So I think it's follow the money. So when, when people have a self-serving interest, there will be fraud. When, when people... Uh, okay, so, yeah. So if you could build a system which was... There were controls on how much money big pharma can make. Yeah, yeah. So you may not know this, that the U.S. population makes up 5% of the world population. Yep. Yet we utilize 55% of prescription drugs are sold in this country. Isn't but, that just because we're more affluent and have access to more drugs No, we, it's just because um, patients are prescribed medications they don't need. And we, we have one of the lowest life expectancies in the Western world. So if, if all of this m medication was actually improving health, then we should see outcomes. You would see the outcome, yeah. yeah. So unless we rank was, about... Unless there was some other variable there, I don't know what it would be since it's such a big country, like it couldn't be water or air. Or, yeah. So we, we, although we spend you know, all of this money on pharmaceutical drugs, we don't see a benefit. And what's interesting is, people may not know this, in the last three or four years, the life expectancy of Americans has gone down. It's gone down. And you can look at COVID. I mean, we, we're the most resourceful, most well-trained. We have the best, so-called best doctors. We have the best system. The mortality from COVID was much higher in the U.S. than it was in almost any Sweden, other country. I was thinking, yeah. Why? So, I mean, we had all... Yeah, I have no idea why. Yeah, it's because we did all kinds of stupid things. So I mean, I mean, it, this whole thing is very disturbing. Yeah. And that's why, you know, what I said is that once you see this, you can't unsee it. And I find it very disturbing because there's a lot of bad. And this this world is run by sociopaths who have no interest in humanity or the welfare of human beings. Boy, if you think the world is run by sociopaths, you should see gender studies departments. These people are like. Oh, key socio. I mean, these people oh, are another awful. level of socio. Yeah, I've read some of the stuff about it. It makes no sense to me. I mean, it, so you know, you know that I'm one of the world's leading gender studies scholars. No, okay. I didn't know that, but I've read a little bit, and I find it so disturbing. And yeah. so, you know, Piers, my he's become my good friend, and you, you know, we say the world's gone mad. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you explain what's going on? Other than we live in a mad world. Okay, so, okay, <laughs> this is such a huge thing. Okay, so. Okay, so fraud. I, I don't really like the term big pharma, but fraud is connected to the pharmaceutical industry, why they want to push certain drugs as a financial incentive, et cetera. And I have my magic wand and I wave that and all of that goes away. This is my interpretation of what you're saying. If it's incorrect, let me know. You're saying that the system is predicated on financial incentives, for example, tenure, grants, promotions, et cetera. And as long as those incentivization structures are in place, the system will remain corrupt. So what we need to do is kind of like a Rawlsian experiment. We need to create independent, I don't know how you do this, but leaving aside the logistics and the practicality for a second, you'd have to create independent institutions, bodies, I don't know what they would be, to do the tests and then release the, that data to the public. There needs to be checks and balances so that it ensures honesty, integrity, and, and true science. And so if the outcome of a study depends upon how much money your company is going to make. I mean, you look at the Vioxx. You know, Vioxx killed, I don't know, 30,000 
Americans. They knew that it caused heart attacks, but they were making money. They, they do an economic balance and say, well, the money we have to pay for malpractice suits or, or litigation is just a drop in the ocean compared to how much money we're going to make. So they, they knowingly allowed people to die to make money. That's the business model of Big Pharma, and it's all of them, is called fraud. That's their business model. They, they are quite happy for patients to die if, and as long as they can make money and they can offset the lawsuits by the profits they make. That's just the way the system works. Okay. Okay. So can, can we take the Pfizer vaccine? Okay. So I'm, have, I'm just... Can I just tell you a fact that most people don't know? Okay. So, <laughs> so Pfizer, you know, you've heard of okay. Pfizer. Yeah. So within the first three months, Pfizer got reports of adverse events from their vaccine. In the first three months, and this, is, this data was obtained by the Freedom of Information Act, Pfizer received data on 42 thousand serious adverse events in the first three months, as well as 1,200 deaths directly related to the vaccine. First three months. It, 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 wouldn't their argument be that more, let, let's, just, let's just say, okay, we accept this by fiat, this is the case. However, on this side, it's like a scale. We saved, you know, certain, <laughs> you're laughing. We saved more a lot. You're laughing, why? Because why? There's, there's no data that the vaccines prevent hospitalization or prevent death. That is a myth that's propagated by the federal government, the NIH, the CDC, and Big Pharma. Wait a second, wait a second, hold on, man. Like, just, okay, okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to tell me, can you just say that again? I, I couldn't so have let me say this have again. heard that correctly. So, yes, let me say that again. Yeah. What have the vaccines been shown to do proven? They have been proven to decrease your rate of people getting COVID and having symptoms of COVID. It does not reduce severe infections. It does not reduce hospitalizations. It does not reduce deaths. Okay. In you, fact, you, you, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. You mean to tell me you are not less likely to die if you've been vaccinated? Is that what you mean? You're to tell more me? likely to die if you're vaccinated. So let me give you an interesting fact. And this is from, you may have not heard this place called the Cleveland Clinic. I know, yeah, I know the Cleveland Clinic. So the Cleveland Clinic did a study and they found that those people that got more shots and more boosters were at a higher risk of getting COVID. Higher risk. The more you got boosted and the more you got vaccinated, it increased your risk of getting COVID. But they won't tell you that. Was the study published? Published. This was published in a peer-reviewed paper, believe it or not. Well, so it did get, so there can't be that much corruption in the journals. So what happens is sometimes these papers slip through. Yeah. Because what usually happens is it's rejected or it gets published, which has happened to us. Yeah. We had a paper published and then within a week it's retracted for no good reason. So somehow, th what, what they often do in these studies is the data, the heading and the data is a little bit deceptive. So, it, you know, if you, if you published a study with the heading, vaccines increase the risk of COVID, it would be rejected. So what they do is they, they, they're, not, they're not dumb. They, they disguise the paper such that it's not obvious at first to the reviewers what the topic is. And so this, this is you know, one of the few papers that has prepared to talk the truth and has revealed the truth. Have other papers addressed that paper and attempted to repudiate it? No. It stands as, as, as uh, a, a true reproducible finding. And there are really good reasons why the vaccine increases your risk of infection. There are multiple papers. Well, okay, um, don't tell me those because I wouldn't understand a single thing you're talking about. Okay, so... So what, what I'm trying to say, and, and this, is, uh, this is shocking for me, is the whole system, it's probably, it's probably you know, you spoke about this gender stuff, but yeah. it, it goes beyond medicine. Well, the whole, sure, sure the, whole, does, yeah. the whole infrastructure is based on fraud, deception, dishonesty, and lies. 
clearly, I did not, however, know that it was so endemic and that it was so, I mean, obviously, I'd need to learn a lot more about, if I wanted to learn more about this, where would I go? What would yeah. I do? So there are a number of really, really good books. Yeah. So you, the true Anthony Fauci by, is a really good book by Robert Kennedy. I haven't read it. Okay, and then he wrote a follow-up book, the, the Wuhan cover-up. So the problem with that book is it's so disturbing. It is a very disturbing book because he does, you know, enormous amount of research. And there's no question what he writes in that book is the truth. I have no question to doubt it. And what you read in that book, it's so disturbing. You realize that how corrupt the entire system is, the badness that they've been perpetuating or doing for 50, 50 years. When you say they, you mean? We're talking about, it's this conglomerate of the World Economic Forum, it's the NIH, it's the Department of Defense, it's the CIA, it's the FBI, it's, and, and, okay. they're all linked together. Okay, okay, so it's, okay. Let's, it's let's truly slow, astonishing, let's, so. Okay, let's slow down a little bit, okay, so, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just take one of those, the Department of Defense. Guide me through how the Department of Defense has anything to do with this. Yes, which is interesting. The Department of Defense was in charge of Operation Warp Speed. The no, Department no, no. of Defense. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the yeah. Department of Defense funded the vaccine program. It it was in charge. The CEO of Warp Speed was employed by the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense underwrote the whole. Pfizer vaccine program. So Pfizer have admitted, yes, we lied, we were wrong, but the Department of Defense told us to do it, so you can't hold us accountable. They, they said that they lied about what? About the, the outcome of the study, the way the study was designed. Th there have been a number of lawsuits against Pfizer, and their defense is, well, the Department of Defense told us to do it. Because we know that in the study they did, they cheated. They cheated in the data in the data collection, in the way they did the study. But their defense was, well, the Department of Defense told us to do this. Okay, okay, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful for me too, because uh, I came, I used to believe in democracy. Um, that's why I came to this country. I thought it represented the, the best democracy is on this planet. And obviously now, I've completely lost faith in American democracy, because I don't think it really exists. I, I'm really disturbed, it's very disturbing. For example, you, you look at the bioweapons program. I mean, the, the goal of the NIH was to develop bioweapons. They've been doing this for decades. They've been releasing pathogens to unsuspecting Americans. They would just release them. They sound like charming people. These are charming people because, <laughs> did I say, did I not say these are sociopaths? You and I, actually, we care about other people. Yeah. You would not want to deliberately harm other people. Of course not. But this is what they do. They release pathogens it, in the- When, when? This is, I mean, over the last 20, 30 years. We know, and this is documented. There's really good data on this. And that's why, you know, if you read Bobby Kennedy's book, The Wuhan Cover-Up, it, it's very disturbing. You know, I talked talk to Chris Martinson and, uh, about the possibility of people from around the world emptying out their insane asylums and prisons and sending people to the U.S. We should empty out all these sociopaths and we should send them to Iran. We should give them a fr free one-way ticket to Iran, North Korea, yeah. Russia. Yeah, it's I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, very, it's, a very, it's very disturbing. It seems that Lyme disease, that kind of endemic in this yeah, country, was yeah. a bioweapon that, that escaped. My friend's mom died from Lyme disease. Yeah, so these people have done terrible things. I learned something reading this book which I found so disturbing is that um, the Japanese did uh, bioweapons experiments on the Chinese. And what they would do is that they were interested in um, what these pathogens did, but they wanted to, study freshly harvested organs. So they would dissect these p 
people who were infected while they were alive. Oh, vivisect them, yeah. They would vivisect them. They would take out their organs while they were alive. I mean, he, I don't know. Okay, okay, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, if I wanted to interview someone who would disagree with you, who would say that's just not true? Who 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 would I talk to? Yeah. So obviously there 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 there, there are people. I mean, people would consider myself and my group of colleagues co conspiracy theorists because this can't be true. I mean, it is it is civilizational. I mean, it is. This is bigger than huge. I mean, this is just enormous catastrophic. in scale. Catastrophic, enormous. Yes. Civilization upending. Who, who would I talk to? So I'm sure you know if you if if they actually did want to speak to They'll you. They'll never speak to me. You know, some Department of Defense They'll or people me. from the NIH. And not only will it, so this is going to happen. Erin, she's over there. She's going to reach out to these people, and you and you know what people are going to tell me? You didn't reach out to anybody. Oh, all the emails got lost. You don't really want to speak to yeah. those people. I mean, we know, for example. That Fauci, you know, he was asked about uh, gain of function research, and yeah, he said yeah, it didn't yeah. happen, and he lied repeatedly. We know categorically. I mean, there is there is evidence, there's email evidence and documentation that they were doing gain of function research. The NIH sponsored email research. We know the NIH spent millions of dollars supporting. And there was the James O'Keefe Project Veritas that caught the guy. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Ridley has talked about that. Uh, he also talked about the, the Wuhan co cover-up in his last book, um, which was excellent. We know that the NIH spent millions of dollars of grants went to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's indisputable. I mean, the NIH data shows this, but if you would ask them, first of all, they probably wouldn't answer you, and secondly, they would say this is not gain-of-function research. This country is doing gain-of-function research today. The, the gain of function research continues. There's absolutely no reason to do gain of function research. Humanity does not benefit from doing. It, for our audience, explain gain of re function research. Yeah, so gain of function means that you take a virus or a bacteria and you manipulate it in the lab to become more deadly and be able to spread more rapidly. Sounds like a great idea. So it's used as a weapon. <laughs> So you know if you drop <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. If you drop a bomb, you can only kill the certain amount of people. If you create a bioweapon, so yeah. this is a bacteria which can spread rapidly, yeah. you can kill millions of people. And that's what they engage in. This is what there isn't there argument for that that you can then better study how to make antidotes and vaccines. Isn't that the argument? So that's the argument they give. Yes. Is that this is a defensive Correct. strategy so that if somebody was to develop a bioweapon, we would be able to mount a defense with a vaccine. The problem is that the vaccines don't work. The vaccines, we know that- When, when we get that from gain of function, they don't work. Well, we know that most of the vaccines they've developed just simply don't work. Yeah, I've never understood the whole bioweapon thing. Like I get the nuclear, I get the, but bioweapon, like we all, we live in different cities, so I get the conventional thing, but I never understood the bioweapon because we're all, we're the same species on the same planet. So like, I never understood what the thinking would be because it could as a potential to kill you and the people you love. Yeah, so I mean, SARS-CoV-2 was a bioweapon. I mean, it, it, although it's a, it, it's a really disturbing thing to say, so the virus was developed in the lab as a bioweapon. And I think we just need to see what's happened in the last three years to see how effective it was in, in that it's killed 16 million people, if not more, and the harm that is done to this planet. So that, that is the potential power of a bioweapon. And people think this is a good idea. Yeah. So Obama tried to out, you know, uh, outlaw gain-of-function research. I remember that, yeah. The NIH and Fauci kind of went around that and you, know, you could do that in foreign countries. Is that the way you get around that? So they could do it in foreign countries, but th it was bad. It sh there should be a global ban on gain-of-function research because most people think, 
almost all people who understand the subject believe there's nothing positive that could come from gain-of-function research. And the downside... Unless you're a homicidal maniac with genocidal aspirations. Exactly. So the downside, which we've just seen, far outweighs any potential positive benefit that could develop from a countermeasure. Okay. Yeah, it's very disturbing, and that's unfortunately the world that we live in. Do you have anything? Do you have anything fun? Do you have anything? Do you have any good news? <laughs> so you ask a good question. Yeah. So I suppose the good news is that I woke up this morning and I, uh, you know, I was alive. That was a good yeah. thing because you look in this world around us. I suppose the good thing is there are some good people left. There are people that actually care, that have a heart, that are interested in yeah. humanity. But unfortunately, the tragedy is that this world is controlled by sociopathic people who have no interest in the welfare of humanity. But they have financial incentives. They have yeah, career they, incentives. They become more and more powerful. So what we've seen is COVID is that the, the, the super rich people have yeah, become, the, yeah, I've read that. Yeah, you know, have yeah. become, you know, their wealth has increased, you know, exponentially while the population. Yeah, I've never understood why one would want more money after a certain amount of money. Yeah, it makes no sense to me. I yeah. mean, I think um, Elon Musk was asking for a salary of $65 billion yeah. or something. I mean, is that not insane? I mean, you don't need all of that money. You don't need a house with 23 bathrooms because you can only pee in one bathroom at a time. It's, it's, it's a mystery That's a to true me. statement, yeah. It, it, um, it's a mystery to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, these people have 20 cars. You can only drive one car at a time. Yeah, um, okay, so, okay, so we have corruption in medical journals. We have kind of wide-scale systemic corruption. We have a populace who is either undereducated or apathetic, or they're educated and not apathetic, but they don't understand the, the magnitude of this, or they just will think you're a nut job and a conspiracy theorist and just write it all off. So to the people I, in the latter category, I have to say, I would love to have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know. But they will, but I mean, so who, who would that be? So do, I mean, do, if do you, you know this guy, sorry to interrupt, do you know this guy, I think his name is uh, Peter Hotez, is that Yes. His? So this is very important. He went on Joe Rogan before RFK. I know he went on Joe Rogan first and then RFK called him out on certain things and Rogan and others offered to pay him to come back and he said he wouldn't debate conspiracy theorists and all this stuff, okay. So he said it's not incumbent upon him, correct me if I'm wrong, but the thing is he already went on Rogan. So he was already moving in the public space. So it wasn't he was like he was some scientist who was in obscurity. Like Rogan has the largest platform in the world he wouldn't go back to have a conversation or a debate or what have you. And so what is your opinion about, have you offered to debate these folks or have, at least have a conversation with them? Yeah, so I mean, I would be prepared to have a conversation with anybody. I mean, Steve Kirsch, you know, who, who, who yeah. runs, he's offered to debate all of these people. He's offered them large amounts of money just to debate him and they won't. Because and well, okay, so it's, it, why, because why? because they know that they can't win the debate, that they, they, they are propagating false information, and that when they're confronted, their evidence just doesn't hold water. Wow, okay. Uh, okay, well, this has been extraordinarily sobering conversation. <laughs> I appreciate your time sure. very much so. Where can people find you? Yeah, at the flccc.net. Okay. So that's what I do. I think people need to open their mind and explore for themselves. I mean, we have a mind, we have ability to think. They need to use that thought process. You can't, I mean, from what we've said today, you, you, you have to be very careful of the sources of information you trust. And you have to investigate for yourself. You have to look for the truth yourself.
because you just can't believe the media, you can't believe the medical journals. We know social media is corrupted, so one has to be really careful what you base your information on. Thank you, doctor, I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Holy fuck. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the world I live in. Holy shit. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.